Hello and welcome to the Swim Brief. Uh, I am Chris DeSantis, and for the first time in a long time, I'm joined by a real live guest. Um, I got uh, reached out, uh, I, I got a sort of a mutual connection through a friend of the podcast, uh, Nico Messer, uh, was at the GAIN conference. He posted something to social media. Um, because it's, as we were just discussing offline, as we started on there, I decided to get angry about something that got posted on social media. And somehow that led to me talking to, um, I believe your official title at Game Swimming, we just discussed is uh, scab picking contrarian. Yes, Chris I Webb. suppose that could be a yes, yes. And you're also a director. That's your secondary yes. role, right? Very secondary, yes. <laughs> Um, so I just want to, you know, people are listening to this, probably a lot of them have an idea of who you are, and I don't want to spend a long time uh, building, uh, making this podcast the uh, biography of Chris Webb. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but uh, let's, let's get the five minute version of how you come to be director of swimming at GAIN and what sort of what's your involvement with gain? And I guess you're also still coaching swimming. Um, mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. that looks like for you today. Yeah. I mean, I, I talk pretty fast, so I could probably That'd do great. it in, in less than five. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, um, I do this fairly often, so I got a, a, a quick one. Um, I'm a son of coal miners and mill workers out of Western Pennsylvania. Uh, that's kind of my background. I grew up in a blue collar family in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, at least that's the way my family started. Um, things went better for my family as we got older, which allowed me to become involved in something like swimming. Um, <clears throat> uh, my mother can't swim, and that's not very uncommon in uh, blue collar poor communities. Yeah. So my mother was scared to death of my brother and I drowning. We joined the local swim club. My brother became an absolute age group phenom. You know, I, at the time, that's how it felt in a local community. Really, my brother was just a top 16. You know, he was just a top 16 kid okay. as an age grouper. And kind of the rest was from there. I grew up swimming uh, summer league. And then just, you know, by sheer luck, we happened to be uh, in the backyard of the JCC Sailfish, which is where um, Pat Mellers, Leah Smith, and a yep. lot of other people swam for Al, the great Al Rose. That's my, my home club. So that was my home club growing up. And I went on from there to swim for Dan McCarthy, who's a national team uh, performance uh, person. And he, I mean, I, so uh, I caught fire that way. I taught swim lessons. I swam summer league. I swam in high school. Uh, I did all those great things. I had wonderful role models, which was probably the best thing I could do. I swam at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, my stint there was short. Being a scab picking contrarian who dreams of swimming night and day, and just being like a marginally on the edge of junior national level swimmer at a mm. team at the time in the, in the late nineties, early OOs when Chuck Knoll, they were good. Uh, we were really good. Uh, I think my sophomore, my junior year, we, you know, in all the polling, we were probably top 15 a couple okay. of times and had relays at NCAAs and all that kind of stuff. So to, to have me, Michael Gruber, uh, was that, that, that era? Mike Grube? Yeah. Mike Mike Grube, Grube, sorry. Yeah. 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 We had, um, I think actually the year before my class at Pitt, we had the best recruiting class only behind Cal Berkeley because Daniel Loader, the 200, 400 Olympic champion, <laughs> oh, went to Cal. Guy. And Bart <laughs> Kizarowski, who wanted to go to Pitt. It was a crazy kind of thing. We had all like the number one recruits in the country for a little while. We were in a very blessed situation where we were one of the few schools in the Northeast who had full men's scholarships, which yeah. we profited from greatly through recruiting. And Chuck did a fantastic job at the time. And Tom Donati, who was the assistant coach when I was getting ready to go to school there, was a masterful recruiter and connector. Anyways, stopped swimming. And I started, I was coaching summer league in the summers. Uh, when I started coaching club, I was in college and Dan McCarthy was the head coach of team Pittsburgh aquatics, which I think is called peak yep. aquatics now. And that's where, um, that's just amazing breaststroker. 200 breaststroker, uh, Josh Matheny yep. came out of, um, and Indiana, I started, yeah. yeah, I started coaching swimming right away, right there. And Dan taught me 
the right way, almost like you would see in a movie montage. The first day of practice, I tried to get in there and do, and do my thing. And he handed me the roster. and was like, until you know everybody's name, you take attendance every day. So I started taking attendance and basically just being like a read the time off guy. And then I went from attendance and reading off the watch to, you know, taking groups. And then he would give me little chunks and say, okay, if you were going to write a practice, what would this be? And then he taught me the energy systems. He was a physio, he was a, he was a trained physiologist by trade. Um, and that's kind of how I learned it. And I was able to add my absolute obsession for swimming. Uh, I was able to add to that um, the physiological background, which is pretty typical for a lot of passionate coaches is to fall into the book love first. So that's what I did. And I became obsessed. I read every article you could possibly read on swimming. Uh, I had Jan Olbrecht's Science of Winning. Uh, the Me week too. it came out in English and the thousand dollar lactate meter that came with it. Unbelievably. Ah. Uh, so I had all that stuff. I mean, we're talking about 99, 2000. Oh my um, God. That's when I started uh, becoming obsessed with this and coaching what I would consider full time because during my final years of college, I was just writing practices all day, every day in class. Right. Um, I wanted to quit and coach and Chuck Knowles was like, you have to get a degree or you can't coach college. You can't do this. So I stayed in school and, and did that. And um, at that time I, I realized in Pittsburgh and Al, I can, Dan McCarthy and Al Rose told me this and Zoe Skirball's dad, Jim were like, if you really want to coach, you have to leave. And uh, so one of my great friends and mentors, Tom Burchill, he had taken over the Carmel swim club, I believe in 2000 uh, after Ken stopped Cotty's departure. And Tom was like, I need an ally and I need someone who wants to learn and, I moved to Carmel, Indiana, started my full-time coaching career there. Uh, I coached for Tom Burchill, and then I worked for with and for Chris Plum and Ian Murray uh, for five and a half years there from 2004 until 2009. Uh, David Marsh called me randomly one day. He was like, hey, man, I'm looking for someone to be the director of all this stuff. We, I think I'm trying to get going at Swim Mac, and I was stupid. So I was like, yeah, I'll do, I'll do anything. So... <laughs> Not that it's stupid to work for David, but I just, I just, I just wanted to try a new experience. So I did that. I went down. I was senior director at Swim at Carolina. Got to work with a lot of Olympians and just amazing swim coaches there. Kathy McKee, um, Alan Fowl, Terry Fritz, just uh, Russ Castle, just to name a handful uh, of the coaches I got to work with. Um, from there, I went from Swim Mac to Fort Collins area swim team in 2012. I took over that club as the head coach. Um, in short order, we went from one junior national qualifier to winning a, uh, a winter junior title, uh, junior world champions, gold medal swim club, yada, yada, yada. Uh, I, I kind of thought we were went to the top of the mountain. So I got involved with T2 Aquatics in Naples, Florida to kind of take on a new adventure in my life. I thought I wanted to get married, have kids, do a bunch of cool stuff. So I moved down to a place where Kevin Erndl was uh, you're very interested in supporting someone who was looking to run a large organization and kind of take it to the next level. I went down there, did that. Wasn't exactly what I wanted. Uh, and then in 2018, when I turned 40, I said, I'm not coaching anymore. I'm going to take a little break and take a step back. Took a step back, traveled the country, met with coaches, and um, – Actually, later on in that year, I started talking with Vern, uh, who was doing our dry land at, at Carmel at the time. Right. And you know, he said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. Do you want to help me without some of these clubs? You've been doing some of the best job of anybody. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll help out. Next thing you know it, I just started rummaging through of all of old Vern stuff and reorganizing all of his things and helping him. Uh, you know, write new books and stuff like that. And he was like, Hey, you should just start taking over these swim teams. And I'm like, that sounds dumb. And I was like, I'm a swim coach. And the next thing I know, and I'm traveling around and I'm realizing, man, I'm working with thousands of kids, not a yeah. hundred kids, not 30 kids. I'm getting around to these clubs and I have value. My knowledge has value and it's worth something and I can share it. And this is cool. So yeah. really that's kind of how I ended up where I am and everything else has just grown from there. And I wouldn't be anywhere without, obviously, I wouldn't be anywhere without Chris Plum and Ian and, and Vern. So it's, it's really hard to say how I got where I am without mentioning at least a few of the people uh, who helped me get where I am. Yeah. And I mean, like, so you're doing this stuff with Gain now. Mm -hmm. And uh, like in that story, 
you know, it sounds like the, the relationship with Vern crystallized within the last two years, but how long had you known him by that point? Well, I, that's a great question. I pro- that, 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 that requires some, uh, some backstory. Um, when, <laughs> Depends when on what your definition of no is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> He's always been there, but then when did you become aware? Yeah. <laughs> right? uh, I, I've always been involved in athletic development, phys- physiology, and things like that since my time with Dan McCarthy. He's the one who got me very interested in it, movement, science, those types of things. So to me, it was a natural outcrop of swimming was physical education, was yeah. exercise science, was movement, was, for lack of a better term, or one that I really deplore, which is strength and conditioning. Mm. Uh, athletic development is really the way I look at it in physical education. Um, I started there, so I started going down all these paths of how do I make swimmers better? How do we, you know, how do we make them healthier? How do I make them perform better? And then I start, I start going down all the natural, uh, you know, gateways, look at stuff that Mike Boyle does, look on the internet, read the, read the, read the classical literature, you know, read Tudor Bompa, uh, read Metviev, you know, re- do all those things that, that everybody does. Uh, check out CrossFit, check out this, check out that, check out bodybuilding. And I was at an ASCA and Vern was speaking as the councilman lecturer. I can't even remember where this was. And I'm like, oh, I heard of this guy. I've seen some of his stuff. He, I've tripped over him in the, li- in the literature. And um, I think I was sitting with Nort Thornton and Nort was like, I've known Vern for 40 years. He was the head track and field coach at Cal Berkeley, you know, and I was like, what? And North's like, yeah, man, this is, this guy's like grade A. And then uh, Jim Richardson, like two minutes later, I was talking to Jim. He's like, Vern's done our dry land since 2000 and, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, I was tasked by Chris to help us continually push the, push the, um, push the envelope at Carmel. Really my role there at Carmel was chief creativity person. It was like, you got to keep pushing. And I would just bring stuff to Chris's doorstep all the time. And Carmel was a, a well-oiled uh, machine in, in some ways, as far as the curriculum stuff went. And well, what does dry land look like? Well, one person does P90X, one person does this, one person does that. And we were trying to create an eight to 18 system that's like a swimming curriculum, but for athletic development all the way up. And we were all like, we don't know anything. We, 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 don't, we know so little. And everyone was like, you should probably talk to this guy. So called Vern up on the phone. 2008 or 2009 next thing you know it he's up there and he's got you know butcher paper all over our office at Carmel and he's you know 15 hours a day for four days in a row writing up all his ideas and concepts and he thought it was uh worthy of his time and effort to try to create something he thought no one had ever done and we because the rest is history we started down that journey and you know here we are today so my relationship stems stems back uh much more than a decade with Vern. And that, it was a, just as a mentor and someone who was kind of running and, and doing our dry land. And because we started at Carmel and I was there at ground level, I went from there to swim back to Fort Collins to Naples. I had installed these types of dry land programming at multiple swim clubs. So I had become de facto the person of, well, what works and what doesn't work depending on what environment you try to install this in, which has probably become the reason that this has become so popular with swim teams around the world, honestly, it's because we're a lot like Bruce Lee, you know, Jet Kundo, the style of no style, you know, we're, princ- we're principles. Our principles are few. Our methods are plenty. Whatever method is required for us to be successful at a club is what we employ. So that's kind of how we ended up here. That's really interesting. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm hearing a few things across this conversation and some of them answer questions that, I probably would have asked if I, you know, if we, if we'd gotten there, but I can, I can see, um, you know, I, I spent five years in business for myself. Um, Mm -hmm. and I definitely relate to that part where you go, you know, it's one thing to be coaching on a team and you have a certain number of people within that team context that, Mm -hmm. uh, whatever you're doing has a, has an impact on, and then transitioning to, um, doing something broader to that and feeling the power of like, oh, I can actually get to all sorts of different places. And if I can, you know, sort of effectively uh, teach what it is I know, then I have an opportunity to make 
a much, much bigger impact. There's something mm-hmm. really, really fun about that. And I think another, another part that really resonates with me as I listen to you say it is, um, it seems that your experience taught you what all the second order challenges are in what mm-hmm. it is you're trying to do, which I think is, is a really big deal. I mean, it's one thing to sort of know something that's effective, be able to teach it, but when it gets out in the wild, right, in all these various environments, as you've experienced, mm-hmm. um, the second order, whatever, you know, like, okay, you get in there, you implement something, you get people started on a path to do it, and then there's always stuff that comes up, and that stuff mm-hmm. is, is, to a certain extent, unpredictable. In fact, I listened, and I'm, I'm thinking back to the 45-minute uh, thing that Vern gave, uh, I think, at game that I'm listening to, and he's talking about the, um, the unpredictability of the competitive cauldron or whatever. Sure. Like, there's yeah. a bit of that, too, in the implementation of this stuff. Like, you... You, you, you have to be ready for what challenges come up. And it sounds like you've had that experience to a certain extent sure. of what can come up when you try to have this essentially, um, as, you, as you don't want to call it uh, a strength and conditioning program, a, a athletic development program sure. coming in mm-hmm. from the outside. Um, and I've always felt like, I think I reached the level about 10 years ago as a swim coach uh, that, I got to the knowing what I didn't know about athletic development. And it's a, mm-hmm. it, it can be a quite a paralytic state, right? Where you just <laughs> go like, what do I do now? Now well, that I know what's Dunning bad. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a Dunning-Kruger effect where you're like, I know what I'm, t- oh, it's no. complicated. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, this is complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. So that said, and I'll, I'll get to the meat of it because we're, we're almost 20 minutes in. I was searching through my phone as you were talking because I wanted mm-hmm. to make sure I got the, the quote right. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, when I will admit to not knowing a lot about game, like I'm learning some of it sure. talking to you. Sometimes mm-hmm. I'm like any other non-game engaged person. Like I just sure. see something on social media. Sure. I will say stuff specifically... Um, that I see coming directly from Gern, from Vern, Gern. Mm. That's my combination of Gain <laughs> and Vern. I like it, Vern, Gern. Gern, like <laughs> Gern Vembetta. Um, he, uh, stuff I see specifically coming with him actually really does rub me the wrong way in the marketing sense. And I'll, I, I was searching for the one that Nico sent me from Gain that really now, was, Are you specifically talking about from Vern's Twitter account? Yeah, some of that. Okay. For sure. Because that's the only thing he controls. So oh, I see. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So so if I see him posting in some other social media, where is or, that coming or from? Or LinkedIn. He posts on LinkedIn and he posts on Twitter and maybe a little bit of Facebook. But like he's like I said, anything he's I'm not on Facebook, Facebook anymore, yeah. essentially. From game swimming. Game swimming's all me. And then okay. uh, I mean, I I don't know. Yeah, just go go run with it. It's okay to get rubbed the wrong way. I I don't, if you don't, don't get rubbed the wrong way, remember Rubin's racing. So yeah, 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 yeah. I don't see. I was searching for the quote, and I just couldn't find it. Apparently, it's not. Um, it wasn't a post on Nico's because um, I know I interacted with it on Instagram, but it was something sure. Burns Burns presenting at game. He's got a slide up, and Nico mm-hmm. captions it. You know, he says like, "This is what people wonder what gain is. This is what gain is," and it's some qu- quote that Vern has put up on a big slide and he's saying Mm -hmm. it starts with something like we're going to eliminate all physical limitations. Oh yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. The mission of the program. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now call me a bit of a literalist. If I'm listening to this, I'm going, so is game promising that it can teach people how to fly? Because if we eliminate physical limitations, right. Conceivably we could just lift off the ground and, take off to the stars well i mean i would say that the easy counterpoint to that is just that gravity is not a physical limitation it's a it's an extra you know it's, it's something outside of us so physical limitations you know, your goal is to defy gravity and one of his first books actually was written is called is about defying gravity at least for if, if for a small amount of time if you can which is what a jump which is what a jump is okay when you leave the ground you're te- technically defying gravity so i mean yeah i mean if you wanted to be a literalist i'll be a literalist back i say eliminating your physical limitations 
remember physical limitations, not gravity. Gravity is an, an imposed force from outside of you. So I would okay, so tell quite, me more, to teach that. me what, teach me what a physical limitation is then. Cause we, we, we admitted before we started that we were both dumb or you did and I didn't, but I, I nodded my head and I meant to agree with you. So treat me as if I'm dumb and teach me what a physical limitation is. So I would look at a physical limitation. Now let's back this up. I'm not going to go into the general sense, like someone might do if they were in like occupational therapy or something like that. There might be a broader yeah. view from this and I could get my I'm uh, sitting in my clinic here. I have a doctor of physical therapy, uh, Dr. Maggie McFerrin. I, I could bring her in. She could probably speak more eloquently from, you know, just a human like gait because you know, everything starts with gait. So if you were, if I was just to go from that, it's like, how does people walk? How do people walk? And you would start from there and you could just look at, um, you know, gait faults and things like that. You start with a big toe. Um, but I would say if we want to speak specifically about swimming and uh, I apologize to the audience because I, I, I'll think out loud. It's not that I've thought about this. Uh, th- uh, this podcast like is all about thinking about out this. loud. Yeah, that's perfect. It's not, like, it's not like I haven't thought thought about this, but I don't know that I have a clear, easy statement. Um, physical limitations in swimming is anything that prevents the body from getting into either a key posture arm action or leg action that would create propulsion or reduce drag. Okay. And those anthropometrics are individual. So like, so, for instance, let's use me. An example. Yeah. I let's cannot streamline. I cannot streamline. Correct. That's, that would be a physical limitation that I That's have. That's correct. Mm-hmm. So if I was going to look at your physical limitation of un- being unable to streamline, I'm thinking about Chris DeSantis as a 40 year old. Okay. Well, if I was looking only at, 38. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were older than me. That's, that's interesting. Okay. Um, I just seem so old. That's all. Uh, you just been around for so long. <laughs> um, think about this in a couple different layers. This is a little bit of 4d chess. Now I would just call it 40 checkers. Cause I can't play chess. That's too hard. Um, Think about those physical limitations and your inability to do a streamline where you are today. So acutely, I'm watching it. I'm watching the streamline and I'm like, hmm, can't do that. So I think to myself, like, how, what does that mean in the water? Okay. Yep. Then I think about it. What, is that, how, how, what does that look like and what does that mean on land? Okay. What does, that, what does that mean? What were the implications of his training that created this? What things in his biology that I can't? do it, you know, that, that, that I can't necessarily change that created this. And what about his longitudinal rise through swimming that created this? So what did the six-year-old Chris DeSantis look like? What did the 16-year-old DeSantis look like? What did the 26-year-old DeSantis look like? Yeah. And so what did the program create? So what did you look like walking through the door biologically? And then what did we create in our call? And what did the culture of the environment create? So which of these problems or uh, for lack of a better term, what did these physical restrictions, uh, where'd they come from? Not just where they are in front of me, but when I'm looking at this again, or I'm looking at this as a program from eight to 18, what does our program create and what do we have coming in the door? It's like Bill Parcell said, we're at the, vic- we're, we're at the mercy of what the NCAA gives us. So like swim clubs are at the mercy of whatever the kids give you. Mm. Uh, so whatever the community gives you and then, but also when you're looking at your finished product and, and like, look, I'm just going to use these terms cause they're easy. I don't think of kids as products. Um, when, when you look at the kids as they leave the program, what are the commonalities? All of our kids have sore lower backs. All of our kids are kyphotic. All of our butterflies have a very interesting breath. So uh, kids who come through your program for 10 years have movement signatures. You've created those. Yeah. You know, so it's like, when you look at the, the fit, trying to eradicate all the physical uh, things, you're trying to think about one, you're trying to reverse engineer as best you can, because everybody's a case study of one, but we know that there are attractor wells when it comes to skill acquisition. And we absolutely know that there are best practices on force production and drag reduction. So high elbow anchoring, streamlining, head posture, arm action, leg action, if I can look at those and I can reverse engineer from the, from optimal force production positions, 
the postures that help you maintain them and the positions that you need to get in and the reduction of the drag positions in the other way, that's reduction. That's how you eliminate all physical restrictions. What gets into the way, what, what gets in the way of this person based on their, you know, if I'm four foot three, man, I got some, you know, I got smaller hands. I, I have some restrictions. It's not like I can have the best stroke in the world and we know, can't fast swim in the world. Yeah. We can't eliminate those, right? You guys, no, can't we cannot eliminate all of those. And I, and also that goes with your streamlining, just so you know, I can't fix, let's say you have hypoplasia in the hip and like the way that your ball and the socket in your hip is, is made. It's so different structurally. There might be no way that I can get you to get into a position to have the correct breaststroke kick. There might be zero way, no matter what I do. So there's right. not, there's, there's no miracle interventions, but if I can get a couple degrees out of your ankle or I can get a couple degrees out of your big toe, I'm in a better place. And that might be the optimum position for you built the way you are. So yeah. that's probably a long answer to eliminating physical restrictions is to optimize the stroke platform for f- optimal force production and also eliminate uh, drag. So drag reduction. Yeah, I think it's actually a great answer. And it's, it's sort of what I was looking for because I can tell you, I, I particularly, I think about this a lot um, again, cause I had, I guess I keep referring to it in past tense. Like I was in business for myself sure. and then I wasn't, I never stopped. Um, I am coaching more full-time now and doing a very sporadic sort of um, mm-hmm. entrepreneurial engagements, sure. consulting engagements on the side. Um, and I would say if I'm being critical of myself, I've thought about this a lot recently. Mm-hmm. Um, I was probably weakest as a business person in mm-hmm. marketing, in marketing. Mm-hmm. So I'm coming at this with, with a particular bent. Um, and one thing that I struggled with was how to get people excited about what I was doing or sort mm-hmm. of properly sell in a broader sense what I was doing and, and feel honest about it. And like sure. the explanation you get, just gave me mm-hmm. for that mission statement to mm-hmm. me seems like, I'm like sitting here like, yeah, yeah. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. But when I read the, you know, when I read the quote in isolation, I'm like, well, he's lying. Like he can't eliminate physical limitations mm-hmm. because obviously I interpreted it in a different way than you just explained it mm-hmm. to me. And then I start thinking like, well, how can I compete in an environment where in my mind, a lot of people market things by exaggerating what it is, or in my mind, they're exaggerating. Mm -hmm. And then I go, should I be exaggerating more? Because, and I'll I'll share my full critique here in in all fairness. After I said that, um, that I didn't like the statement, I said, but my opinion of gain is that it's a really good product. Mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. Um, I have never spoken and I've spoken to a lot of people that have gone to a game conference or work sure. with you guys. I've mm-hmm. not spoken to a single person who goes, yeah, you know what? It's a little overrated. Like they're mm-hmm. not delivering on what they say. I, no, sure. they're all yeah. thrilled with it. Right. Sure. So like I have complete faith that you guys are delivering something really good. And mm-hmm. then I think, well, maybe it's okay you know, to say what maybe in my mind is a bit of an exaggerated statement. If in the end, you're still giving people really great value for what they invest into it, which is what I hear from all. Yeah. Ends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think you're talking about a marketing thing that we talk a lot about. I mean, it's like remember Vern's in his, in his mid to late seventies and, you know, he's been doing this as him for 50 years. It's him. It's just yeah. him. What is gain? I don't know. You know, we're, we're defining a lot of that um, as, you know, we'll probably see some better marketing and uh, we don't have any marketing. That's the one thing is like, we don't really have any marketing. Those are just people who like us are putting out our mission statements. We don't have a marketing package. We don't have a marketing director. We, we have myself, Vern, uh, some of our great swim coaches and Martin Bingeser, who's kind of like runs hammer media, who's probably our biggest supporter and probably going to be, you know, taking over gain in the next, I don't know, when, when Vern retires in like 500 years, cause he's the healthiest right. 75 year old ever met. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're working on a lot of those things and, you know, that's a little bit of my background. You know, my, my father now owns 
a software company and, and uh, a digital marketing business. So during the pandemic, I did some inbound marketing uh, for them. So I got a little bit familiar. So I have an idea of you know, marketing funnels and things like that. But uh, here's what I will tell you um, about what we're doing. Yes, we'd like to have some more business. So we'd like to be able to make this something that's a sustainable process, which is really what it's all about. You know, some people I actually had a coach accuse it, it, This is, you know, I, I got this, I got this statement. I got this statement from a friend whose father's a, a Navy SEAL, a stepfather's a Navy SEAL. And he, I've taken this to heart. Uh, he, he called me, a, I don't know, he called me something about, a, you know, just like treating kids like robots or, you know, in it for the money, like a huckster or something. And, and uh, I got this statement and, from my friend and he said, I've been called worse by better. And, you know, when people say that stuff about us, that's what I think about. Like, well, I've been called worse things by better people. So I'm not really that worried about, <laughs> you know, and being called a silly name because we're trying to make sure that we can make some we're trying to make money. It's like the end of the day, it's like, look, man, we're all, we all have to make money and live. And I found a way, or we're finding ways to do that. And look, there's people out there who have money, Chris. And we, I learned this during the pandemic with, with my gym space here with my partner, Carl Stewart, the USA Swim Academy, which was a streamlined brand swim lab, uh, bought the, bought it out. And we put a gym in here and like I'm working on a daily basis with athletes going into the water, out of the water, into our gym, because our gym's connected to the endless pools. And if I could just get a one lane, 25 yard pool, I'd probably never leave here forever. Mm -hmm. um, I'd have everything I wanted to get where I want. I have high speed cameras. I got everything I would want and I could do all this stuff. And during the pandemic, we had lots of wealthy families who were like, I want, it. I want something special for my kids. And, you know, the swim coach in me, which is the idiot part of a lot of us, which is this insane uh, vow of poverty concept, which is Don't even just get me stupid. Started. Don't even it's get me started. It's just absolutely stupid. These people had, these are, these are $500,000, $600,000 a year annual income families, power lawyers, doctors, real estate brokers, and... <laughs> They were like, we'll do anything to swim in these pools. We'll do anything. And I said, okay, well, I don't want to do this. How about $500 an hour? And they were like, done. Can I send all three of my kids? And I said, yeah. And there was a while where I was like, man, I can't believe I'm, I'm like taking these people's money. Well, they, were, they would have given me double. And then I talked to my friend who works in tennis at IMG. And he's like, some of these people pay $50,000, $60,000 a year for tennis lessons in New York. And I'm like, when I went to Naples, the tennis pro made $350,000. And I'm not going to get into some money talk here because that's just, that's just, that's, that's boring. But you don't have to do this stuff for free. And if you work your ass off and you're, you have, you think your information has value, the market will tell you whether or not it has value or not. And this is a really long way around for me to scoop this back into marketing and things like that. Well, look. I'll work as hard as I can. Vern and Chris Plum and Ian work as hard as we can. Some people have said, well, you know, gain's expensive. I said, no, it's just out of your price range. It's not expensive. It's not expensive. It's, not expensive. it's just, it's I'm gonna, not. I'm going to concur your, with you. It's not yeah, expensive. It's just not in everybody's budget at the time. And it's very cheap compared to if I sat down and gave you, you know, a pitch for us. I'm like, if you have 250 kids on your club, what we charge you for our highest level package, it's like $2 and 83 cents a kid per month. It's the cheapest thing ever. And we don't want to work with thousands and thousands and thousands of people. It doesn't make you have a good product. So no. I guess what I'm saying is marketing and all those pieces for what we're doing, it's not nearly as important as that the people that we work with get the value that they think they're supposed to be getting from us. And then we give 100% of our time to these people. Yeah. It's, we're not an app, dude. We're not an app. We're not a, you know, we're not a program. I come to your pool, man. I come there. I work yeah. with you. I talk to yeah. you on the phone. If something happened with our program, I would fly to your pool the next day. If something happened, rash of shoulder injuries, I'll be there. You know, yeah. I think that that's the human part of it. That's the coaching piece. Fern's a coach. We're not businessmen. We're terrible businessmen. But our, our marketing package is, is zero. We just want to coach kids and coach the best to be better.
I, I think you're touching on something that God, like I told you, you asked me how I was doing before we started. Yeah. This. You're, you're touching on the thing that just got me real fired up within yeah. the last 24 hours, because I occasionally I get, because I love the sport of swimming, because mm -hmm. I love coaching swimming, sure. because I love all this stuff. I get really upset that, like you say, like, uh, you know, you don't want to get into discussing money. I totally understand that. Yeah, yeah. But like, can we talk about money in the context that there are so many people who are doing what we're doing, they're great at what they do, mm -hmm. and they're living at basically poverty levels doing oh, it. And yeah. it's insane to me. Um, mm -hmm. And, it's, um, and it, it, it's, it's not right. And so that's why I totally agree with you when you say, it's, it's not expensive. And somehow we have found a way collectively, I say we have been a part of it, just like anybody yeah, else. Yeah. We found a way to create a sport with a lot of people involved in it. I'm not saying every family that we have is so affluent that they yeah. could afford to spend more on swimming, but we have a lot of people involved who probably, if they got more um, or if it was, if they were honestly presented with what they were paying for, would pay more for what they're getting. And, and we have so many of those people and yet we've, we've created a business model that has a lot of people delivering it on the other end who are just barely getting by. And yeah. the problem with that is exactly what you point out, which is what are you, wh when there's a problem, you know, you still have a lot of coaches who are like firemen who are just running around, you know, like every time there's a problem trying to solve stuff, but it's not sustainable in the way that you guys have built up something from the sounds of it, that it mm -hmm. is sustainable that when you have a big problem, yeah, I'll fly in the next day. And we've planned for that. Mm -hmm. We have, we've, we've planned to have the resources to deal with that. It's not like, yeah. oh, we'll just make it up at a later date. No, like this is part of the plan that we will mm -hmm. be there and give you this level of support. Yeah, ours is make big money, spend big money. And that's like yeah. put it back. It's like not that we. So that that sounds like oh, you guys think you make a lot of money? No, no, no. Like we need to make enough money so that we can spend a lot of money on the programs and right. spend a lot. Of, we just did a meet in Sarasota, and I was talking to Brent Arkey about it because we host coast it with the Sharks, and it's like I think we made like thirteen cents, you know, because we just we spent every do <laughs> we spent every dollar. We spent every dollar on the meat and on the kids yeah. and on the coaches and on catering and on having, you know, fun and all these different kinds of things. And that's a completely different subject, but, um, you know, a great person to have on your podcast would be George Heidinger, who's the head coach of the uh, Pikes Peak Athletics in, in Colorado Springs. He's my best friend. You should have him on because he's my best friend. Um, right. For full disclosure, he is. But uh, he started a swimming program. He has a six plus million dollar building in Colorado Springs next to the Olympic Training Center. It's a brick and mortar building. It's beautiful. He built that from four kids in the swim lesson program. He built that from four kids in swim lessons from scratch. And now he coaches Quentin McCarthy. He coaches Lindsay Mintenko's daughter, who's an absolute stud. They have yeah. a great swim team. He's got a PT in his building. They're getting ready to, to build an outdoor 50 meter Mirtha pool right next to their insane facility. The, and George's a classically trained artist, but he also knew that if he wanted to do things the way that he, he, they needed to be done, he needed to become a master at business. And George became a master of business. Um, and he built a swim lesson program, built a team from scratch, and then built the business plan, then built the building, and now he works for himself. And I think that, you know, if you're going to rely on mom and pop style of coaching you're going to get a mom and pop style of job security which is none and yeah. to ask or to demand that from a mom and pop is not right that's my opinion it's not right to go into a mom and pop team it's a parent run board and demand all the stability and all this money and all these things you know if, if that's not the mission of the team it's not your job to change the mission of the team it's your job to get the correct job start your own team do your own thing and uh, learn a little bit about business and, and succeed and fail. And I, I gave a talk with Ian Murray at the National Team Coaches Convention, I think in 2017. God, I think it was 2007. I can't remember now. Um, and, and, and we talked a lot about these things. And I did a lot of research on this with Dr. Rock King 
and some other people talking about coaches burnout. And some of it is feeling pinned in. Now, what happens is 20 years of making $36,000 a year, and then you get tired and you're changing teams every five years. And you're starting over. Oh, I'll rebuild. Oh, I'll rebuild. Oh, I'll rebuild. Uh, minimal, minimal retirement, minimal skills outside of the pool deck and an escalating desire for you to make more money requires more time and effort on the pool deck. Th that doesn't jive with what uh, the expectations of an age group coach who's governed by nine-year-old mommies uh, affords you. So right. there, you become trapped. So what happens is you get trapped and that becomes a tough part. And you do one of two things. You do what I did, which is, and I, I had some mental illness, some pretty severe depression, some other things uh, that, went, that went along with my departure from swimming and at, at T2 and, you know, um, Tom Yetter and, and, and uh, Kevin Erndel were really highly supportive of me taking a break. Um, but, you know, you get into these situations where you don't, you don't think there's anything else you can do. Right. You know, at the time, my partner and I, I was like, don't work, blah, blah, blah. This is uh, make real good money. And the next thing you know, you're like, well, if I stop working, we're, I, I can't take it. There's no break. There's no break. So, you know, a lot of it has to do with how we choose to set it up. And uh, you can blame the system a lot, but you should blame yourself more. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, you have the right to alienate your own labor. So if you go into this labor market and decide that you want to work as a swim coach, you know, it'd be nice to have information about how it's going to go, but it'd be also nice to ask some better, it'd be also better off, you know, buyer beware. It's like worker beware. No one told you, you have to coach 70 hours a week and do this. You're just, you've become obsessed and that's a good thing. And there's a, you know, who Seth Godin is. Are you familiar with Seth? Yeah, for Godin? sure. For sure. So Seth had this really good blog post. I don't know, maybe six years ago or five years ago. And I'm going to butcher this, but I'm going to say it. There are three types of work in this world, okay? Three types of work. There is work that produces things that are valuable in this world. They are doctors, engineers. They create massive value propositions in the world, okay? They're invaluable. The world can't function without these people. Those are jobs of high value. And they pay, they usually pay good, okay? Right. There are jobs that create wealth in this world, bankers, real estate, and they make insane amounts of money. And then there are jobs that are important. Teachers, coaches, caretakers, people like that. Yeah. They're the most important people in some ways. And they have jobs that have value. Everybody values it. But the value is in the relationships, not in the money that you receive. That's a low uh, profit proposition. Right. You have to know that when you're getting into this, that you are on the third rung of profit, highest rung of importance, because you're actually nurturing the people who will become engineers, lawyers, or will become value creators. And then if you're really lucky, you'll work with someone like Elon Musk and you, you, know, you create value and wealth and you know, then you're going to Mars. But that's really what you're doing is you're a funnel for the success of the society and you don't necessarily get paid for that. And to, uh, for people to, to wrongly have their paradigm and they're looking upward at the second level of this, like doctors and lawyers, they're like, I'm as valuable as this person. I need to be paid like this. It's like, what well, you don't understand the market that you've misunderstood that. And if you want this as your profit level, you either have to change where you are. So change vocations, or you have to have a better mind for this. And it's like, at some point you just have to say like, well, is it kids over money? And it's like, you don't have to have an either or proposition, but if you're not happy with it, like my dad has software engineers that make more money than I do. And I'm like, I'm smarter than this guy. I'm smarter right. than this guy. I work way harder than this guy, but you're not in a field that gets seven, eight weeks of vacation and, you know, pays 250. You're in the wrong business. So if you start to get your eyes on that, that should be a trouble marker for yourself and not for, it's a long story short, not for uh, the market of what we're in. So buy it. It's like own a swim school, man. What can I tell you? You know, start a swim school if you want to make some money. Don't Build be in coaching.
build your own pirate ship if that's uh yeah. is that 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 is that the gist of your advice or be happy to ride in somebody else's understand what lane you're driving in and yeah. do the be the best driver you can in that lane and stop looking over because the c word compare it's a tough thing to do i mean we all have friends who are lawyers and doctors we all have our friends who we went to who were so dropped at who were so dropped dead drunk in college that, that you're like oh my god how's this person going to succeed and you know, they're making it in the business world because there's just, I mean, money just falls out of trees in the United right. States for that kind of stuff. And it doesn't for what we do, because this is not a profit driven thing. So either, you know, I guess, I guess it's two parts. One is that the market's not set up for that. And two, it's that people get into this career with a misunderstanding or interpretation of what's at the end of the tunnel. They might hear that, you know, Eddie Reese makes a million dollars. Or, you know, de, de, coaches at Dynamo, you know, they do this and they do that. It's like, let's say that that's true. Well, that's like four people out of like 10,000. That's not good. That's not a good. That's yeah, not, you're banking on yourself being one at one out of uh, yeah. 2,500. Yeah, that's uh, right. Not not a great plan. It's not good. And I, I mean, I, I've had long conversations with Jen Lamont, who I think is going to do awesome stuff at ASCA. She mm -hmm. came over to Sarasota a few weeks ago and spent a bunch of days with her shout out to Jen. She's really trying really hard. And one of the things we talked about is, you know, the thing they never do in our coaches education is actually give you a good, they don't arm you with enough information about like, this is actually what coaching is. It's like, Oh yeah, you need to do the, you need to do the Oreo cookie when you, when you compliment kids, it's not like, Hey, by the way, when you're done at the pool and you've been sick all week and you're coaching and you feel like shit and you feel terrible, uh, and then you go home to your wife and kids, the best pieces of you, you have like nothing left to give to the people who are the most important. So, you know, how are you going to navigate that? Oh, you are a 25 year old maverick who run up and down the pool deck and screams and yells, but now you're 50 and the nine year old moms are like, why don't you scream and yell anymore? And you're like, because I'm 50, you know, it's yeah. like, they don't, they don't arm you with any of the appropriate tools to navigate a career as a coach. They just give you the tools to like, Go on the pool deck, go off the pool deck as if you were a robotic coach. So I think I think Ask is going to do a better job at that. I'd be very interested to see that because that's probably where I've spent most of my time away from traditional coaching and where I find myself drawn more and more is to sort of towards the coaching of other coaches on how to deal with oh now i can't hear you oh you you were talking <laughs> sorry i got it um yeah the coaching of other coaches and uh just being able to deal with some of that real life stuff um you know my yep. my background is in positive psychology and what i always say to people you know when when they were defining game and i'm always mm -hmm. asked to define positive psychology I would say um, positive psychology is partly sort of the, the prehabilitation of the mind, you know, yeah. whereas I, I never make a promise. Uh, I've dealt with my own mental health challenges. I've talked about mm -hmm. them on this podcast. Um, mm -hmm. And I never make a claim to be a psychologist. I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not trained to do any of that. I'm not trained to... Uh, diagnose diseases and make treatment plans and all that stuff. But what I can help people with is how to prepare for hard times ahead so that you're less likely to find yourself in that deep, dark place. Um, sure. And I, I think there's great value in that. And I would love to see more of that uh, in a coaching education. Yes. Rather than um, even the fundamentals of, I totally agree. You disagree with the Oreo cookie uh strategy as well <laughs> i've, I've written about that about and... <laughs> it is being like hey you you know here's coaching 101 sure. you know, i think john sure. leonard and chuck wilgus god bless his soul you know was like hey let's make oh, money we don't together. say we, we don't say everybody. god bless his soul yeah. to about chuck wilgus i i he's like <laughs> you know enemy number one for me um i think he did so much damage maybe now we're getting to the end of the podcast i don't want to start a new <laughs> argument <laughs> Yeah, I, didn't, I mean, I, I, I have so many friends who were in the building with Chuck. I guess, you know, I got, I got to see some, I got to see and experience some, you know, oh, people remember loved every, him there. People every loved man, him there. every man, 
one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. Sure. So that's uh, I always I always try to use the Palestinian Israeli conflict to have people understand how divisive an idea could be. When I was in college, we used to read the papers in Palestine. And then we'd read the, uh, you know, maybe like the Israeli Times or something about the same incident. And right. so like, the, just to give you an idea of like Spinoza said, no matter how thin you slice something, there's always two sides. Um, I was just going to say, you know, <laughs> to stay on topic for, for the education <laughs> piece, they clearly were like, I'll make sure that you make money from this. So you know, they, they had this huge initiative that everybody had to do this. And in concept, it's a great idea, but there's a lot of great concepts, but didn't make anybody get better. I mean, uh, I was right there at the get, getting the grandfathered in level, I tried to take that test without the information and failed. Like, right. how could you be so many years into your career and have to take this test that you can't pass? And then you understand that it's proprietary knowledge, number one. And number two, it's not agreed upon uh, stuff. And, you know, and, and uh, I was speaking at the golf coaches convention and, um, uh, Joe Schoenfeld, Joe, Joel Schoenfeld was there. And, Schoenfeld, and yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, and this is, Joel, if you're listening to this, please don't take us the wrong way. Um, I used to not like Joel. I, I, I kind of was mad at the, I kind of I kind of didn't like some of the directions that USA Swimming was going. And I just felt like, man, they hired this, they hired another suit. Like, here we are, we hired another suit. Tim Henchy comes in, we're getting rid of all the swimming people and we're hiring suits. And I'm getting pissed. But anyways, I, I, I went to the golf coaching clinic in, uh, in Texas this year, and I spoke, Brent Arkey, myself, Mary Liston, who's an absolute treasure that I, you should have on here. Mary Liston's amazing. Um, and I got to hear Joel speak a bunch and talk a bunch, and he asked me some great questions about what they were doing at USA Swimming. Anyways, I left that place being like a huge fan of Joel. I'm like, this guy's great. Yeah. This misunder misunderstood. And how 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 hard he's working for coaches at USA swimming is it's, it's misunderstood, man. He he's working very hard and uh, he seems he's got his heart in the right place. He's working super hard for us and super hard for kids, but he's like, well, what's wrong with our system and what's wrong with this stuff that we need to add to our educational system. And I said, basic pedagogy, no one knows how to teach anything because we came from a golden era of, of coaches who were teachers so you can go ahead and put flying V or you know, whatever the silly crap they had in that original ASCA literature, which I'm sorry. It's like John Leonard, some of that stuff, you guys let that just go to garbage. Yeah. You know, and they're having to retool the whole thing and it has to have teaching in it because all of our coaches, they're not, they're not classically trained teachers anymore. They're ex athletes and they don't know how to stand away from diving so that the kids are watching them and not right. the divers while they're giving examples. They don't know how to put together a lesson plan. They don't know how to do any of those things. They're looking at physiology and psychology, and they don't understand that pedagogy is the basis of all of this. So anyways, my thing about the, that ASCA tooling, uh, that, that ASCA USA swimming little not so great conglomeration, yeah, right. which we yeah. all saw through. We saw, I mean, you had to see it through that. You saw it oh, instantly. Been that's been another one of my punching bags for like a, at least yeah. a decade that yeah. ask a relationship, but it's just so easy uh, yeah. as you point yeah, out. Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, it's, yeah, it's low hanging fruit. It's a low hanging yeah. punching bag. It's like, yeah, but they, they, they made themselves a punching bag. And, you know, like I said, Jen Lamont might be a good person to have on here. Uh, and, and look, the people who are involved in asking now, uh, Ken Heiss, you know, Chad Onkin, uh, you know, Brett, uh, uh, Braden Holloway, there are some, Mitch Dalton. I mean, these are people that I can speak of personally as being wonderful, well-motivated people. So I think if they can resurrect this thing, it's going to be great. And, you know, not to go against my own clinic, our gain swimming clinic, which is September 9th to the 11th, which is right over top of ASCA. <laughs> it's right over top of ASCA. And it's always been, Chris, and I'll tell you why. It's because for a long time, we didn't believe in ASCA. And we were like, yeah. don't go to this, come to this. We're going to actually so let's teach have you some something. counter programming. Yeah. Yeah. Let's have a counter program. We're going to actually teach you something. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, well, that's where I a would, lot of that came from. I, I would say USA swimming's uh, cause I, I mean, Joel Schinefeld, I've fed him, I've cooked him dinner and fed it in my house. Um, oh. So I like to think I know him a little bit. I have observed from afar 
I never spoke to a single person who had a negative thing to say about Joel until he worked at USA Swimming. And now I hear from somebody right. every week yeah. telling me what a horrible job he's doing at USA They're wrong. Swimming. They're wrong. I'll uh, say it. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't. I, I think you I think you're probably right that they're wrong. I mean, because I yeah. again I'm biased. I, I really like him. But to me, it goes more to USA swimming in that. So you had that experience, you got close mm -hmm. enough to Joel that you could form that opinion. Yeah. But what is going wrong in the way that they communicate what they're doing? That unless you know somebody, and like again, the only reason, in my opinion that you had a positive view of Chuck Wilgus was you were close enough yeah. to see Correct. the people. And I know all the people in there loved, yeah, as sure. far as I could tell, loved him mm -hmm. as a Everybody leader. loved Chuck. Yeah, Correct. sure. Mm -hmm. They don't seem to be able to communicate what's going on there effectively ever to the vast majority of people that they need to communicate it to, right? Yeah, well, I think that that, I mean, I don't want to get into a political discussion, but I can tell you that that's what happens. I always want to get into a political discussion. When an ins <laughs> institution, institutions, when institutions yeah. become too big and they become less governance and more management, which is what they became under Chuck. I mean, I don't want to talk about the salaries, but I can tell you what, I wish I would have had Pat Hogan's job there. When, if sure. you took a look at their, if you took a look at their 990. I have you know, you many times. Their chief, their chief counsel. I mean, this lady was robbing, she was robbing our membership blind. You know, it's like this person is part time our chief counsel and she's making what? Over half a million dollars a year. What's she doing? Talking to these guys for half an hour a week. Yeah. Um, you look at some of that stuff and you notice that they started getting bigger and bigger. But people asked for it, like club development. We had all these performance consultants. We had all these people. They were like, do this, do this. And, and what happens is when you start collecting money, and this is what I, this is, this is the libertarian piece of me, but I don't even consider it libertarianism. I consider it to be just good, good governance, like good governance. If you start collecting the money, you're never going to give it back. You're going to continue to have a program that runs out of control and government yeah. bureaucracies always do that. And I'll give Tim Henchy a little bit of credit. Dude, club development was out of control. It was huge. Yeah, had all these people, all this stuff. And look, I like I, I liked and loved a lot of the people who worked in that system. Marquesi. I mean, there's a lot of great people who worked in there over the years who are great friends. But dude, that was a job program for retired coaches. Yeah, that was just a jobs program. That's yeah. all that was. Oh, I don't want to coach anymore. Go to USA Swimming, make seventy five grand, do all this stuff, travel around. Especially tell if you're from Indiana. <laughs> yeah, tell that's right. If you're from Carmel, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, it's like dude, I love Tom. I, I love all that stuff. But that's kind of what it. And and things can, as as the adage says, you can become too big to fail. And USA mm -hmm. Swimming was becoming that. It was becoming a behemoth. You know, and it's like, well, instead of stealing this money from us, which is kind of what it is when you're like, I'm raising the dues. Well, raising the dues to do what? And right. then the next thing you know, we have all these giant programs that are just these, these giant behemoths, you know, like club development or where the national junior team was going. It's like we're putting all these resources into all this stuff and a lot of resources into too few things, you know, and it's like, but they think they're doing the best. It, 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 that's a mentality that like a centralized government can affect change and like the individual people have no agency and they, they couldn't possibly know what they want to do with their own money. So it's like some of that stuff was just that was just no housekeeping. Instead of cutting things, you just keep adding and it becomes this like Frankenstein type institution. And that's clearly what USA Swimming was. Maybe the pandemic was the best thing that ever happened to them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of these other like uh, things that they had been brushing under the carpet for years, maybe some of those things coming to light were some, were some of the best things that could ever happen because you clean house and you put people in there. And, yeah, the communication part, man, I can't say that. That was probably my biggest uh, piece of disenfranchisement with the whole thing was like, didn't feel like they were giving us any information. They felt like it was really bad. And dude, there was nothing worse than Olympic trials for a swim coach. If you were a swim coach at Olympic trials, talk about feeling like a second, third, or even fourth class citizen. Hmm. They had people following us around and yelling at us if our mask came down over the tip of our nose and over that stupid yellow rope were thousands of people sitting there with no masks on. And it was like, get out of the way, put on your mask, move, move, move. Don't come into the building. 
get out of here. And it's like, well, there's a box right behind us with Tim Henchy sitting with no mask on. And right. here we are. We have these people looking at us and yelling at us about these. It's like, wow, this is some bullshit. This is, this really makes me hate this. Yeah. You know, I told Brendan Hansen that I'm like, look, man, it's, we're coming to this thing and, you know, either this is a lie or it's just lip service. And this is what I said at USA swimming. When I talked, you guys keep telling us that the coaches are the lifeblood of it. Well, you're liars because I see how you treat us and you don't treat us. You think that we're just a funnel to send you these national team members to keep these big ass paychecks flowing into your laps, but you don't coach anything and you don't do shit. If USA swimming exploded tomorrow, guess what would happen? Randy Reese would be right. Swimming would be just fine. You know, as much as I, as much as, you know, I like, I mean, I'm good for, I like Randy. He's nice to me. I don't know what I did for for Randy to be (laughs) nice to me. How did you pull that off? I mean, I don't know. When I moved to Florida, I think he was just, I mean, he, I don't know. Maybe I just didn't take his crap or something. I don't know. We, we need a whole He's podcast right. on. Yeah, no, I, I, if that look, whole I, building blew up without the people in it and right. the people were all like, I'll do a different job. I mean, maybe we could talk about blowing people up. I don't want to blow those people up. Those, those are all nice people. If something happened, guess what, man, the swim meets would happen. Someone else would insure us. You know, it's like, there's an insurance company out there. We got it. You guys aren't teaching us how to do any of these jobs and coaches organize this from the beginning. All it would be is like a great, you know, setting us back to the grassroots version of this. And guess what? Tori Husk would still be the world champion because she was produced in an age group program. Probably never got a, a single resource from USA Swimming. So um, they don't have anything to do with the NCAA effectively either. Yeah. yeah. So and I, they, I, they rely I, on them to be the, they, we've been relying, USA Swimming has been relying on a club system that they've, neg- that they're neglecting now and an NCAA system as something has been taken for granted to produce their athletes. You yeah. Know. So I, 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 you know, if we keep the political part of this just to swimming, yeah. I am, um, I am something of a sports libertarian too. You know, I, I, I have often said exactly what you just said, which is, yeah, like if USA swimming ceased to exist um, tomorrow, we mm-hmm. would still be the number one swimming country in the world. I think actually we got a great example of it um, in terms of gymnastics where even though that organization basically has not been functioning as a as a governing body for mm-hmm. years mm-hmm. um and in fact doing great harm to their athletes during Stupid. those years yeah usa u.s gymnastics is still really strong so what yeah, does that tell you well the athletes are strong because <laughs> yeah. the athletes are still there there's still hopefully some coaches in that sport yeah. who aren't doing horrible, you know, awful things to kids. I'm sure there are, I don't know a lot about. Of course it's just, it's a filtering mechanism in society that people who want to do harm to children filter their way towards children. So that's like another thing. It's like, Oh, you know, the institutions are, it's like, no, dude, you have to understand that people who want to touch kids get in situations where they can do it. Sure. It's it's not, it's not the organization. There are those too big to fail situations where they find out about abuse, abuse and do other stuff, but they're, and there's, like I said, there's two sides to every story. I'm sure there's people in USA Gymnastics who are like, man, they're painting a really negative picture of us. And all we ever wanted to do was help kids. And I never even heard of this shit. Right. You know, I guess right. maybe because I was a Penn State fan. And it's like, you know, it's like Joe Paterno never molested a kid in his life. Guess what? If you ask anybody, he was a child, molest- you know, like he was the enabler of child molestation. It's like, what? That guy never touched a kid in his life. So there's always like a. I mean, those organizations but he probably got too big to fail. You know, yeah, in a certain like, way. Some of it's like some of it's speculation. Some of it's not. Some of it's like, uh, you know, it's like when you're in because I've been close to some of these things. Like, you know, I, you know, Carmel Swim Club had a terrible situation a few years ago with a coach going on the ban list and having a relationship with an athlete. And you know, you talk to people who are close to the situation, and it's like, dude, on a day to day basis. In hindsight, we're all smart enough to see these signs. And there's no training for, you know, you get into a situation, you walk into your house and you walk in and your wife is there and she's killed somebody in your living room. They're like, oh, yeah, if you see it, if you see it, the first thing you do is call the police and turn your wife in. Is that the first thing you do? No, it's not. 
So now we just know that there's more to, we know that there's more to a lot of this crazy stuff. Yeah. And I, I guess maybe now I'm, now I'm defending institutions. This is my contrarian piece. Like I'm always trying to like switch back and forth and, you know, institutionally, I think USA swimming and I don't really know where we're going and where we're going with this, but uh, I think we're about to wrap it up. I got to yeah. pinch it off somewhere, you sure. know, pinch it off somewhere. I could talk for like six hours about swimming. So um, yeah, I, I, I just like to see, and like you said, to remember that life is about relationships and if you want to get to know people like Joe Schoenfeld, you have to talk to him. And if you want to get to know people at USA Swimming, you have to talk to them. You just can't talk about them. And I think that that's a, a major problem um, in the sport. You know, Coley Stickles, David Marsh, you know, any of these people who can have slightly polarizing um, positions or even like we talked about with just that statement. If you look at something in isolation, you deny the fact that life is complicated and full of nuance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, hopefully that's what we, that's what, a, that's what a scab picking contrarian can do is pick away. But at the same time, remember the, the most important thing, which is no idea is above criticism, but no person is below dignity. Yep. Yep. Well, I, you did an amazing job bringing us all the way back to the opening of this podcast. So that's <laughs> where I'm going to close it. Right there. I want to thank you so much for coming. Thanks for being willing to talk about literally whatever with yeah, me. Sure. People, people who listen to this know this is this is going to be um, for people who actually like listening to my podcast. If you don't <laughs> like listening to it, you're going to hate this one. But if you like it, this is exactly what you listen for. Well, it's tell those people to. Yeah, that's, tell those that's I already do that. Off. I already yeah, do fuck that. You. Yeah. <laughs> from Joe Rogan that. to the rest of, yeah go fuck yourself don't listen oh, okay all right I, all right I don't want to get a full explicit rating I think we, <laughs> in the last 10 minutes as long as nobody listens to the last 10 you minutes you can bleep we'll that out that's right oh no 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 that's too much editing work for me to do I just have to leave it and hope uh, hope that nobody uh, makes a big stink but um, I appreciate it um, thanks for coming on good luck um, cool. with everything and um, thanks for uh being willing to uh, teach me a few things. Sure. And uh, to everybody that's listening, thank you for listening. Um, this has been another week and uh, I'm sure I'll be back with something else next week and awesome. uh, talk to you then.